In your time playing KSP, you might have noticed that the exhaust from engines is able to push on other parts. You may have even experimented with using this force to make a mass driver. I've actually used this in the past to make a mass driver for my Arakeen Citadel, and to give Val a little push in this three-part Taduna Ike and Minmus mission. Can we push this further though? How fast can we accelerate a projectile using this method? First, let's understand what's going on here in terms of KSP. We have a projectile that starts at the engine nozzle. When the engine is ignited, a force is applied to this projectile by the exhaust gases. The projectile is then accelerated for the distance of this exhaust plume. Once leaving this region, it stops accelerating and now has some ejection velocity. We can predict the final velocity from this equation. Velocity equals the square root of 2 times the force of the engine times the distance that force is applied divided by the mass of the projectile. This is derived from the conservation of energy. Check the description for more information if you're curious. We'll use this equation to see how well KSP matches this theoretically ideal model later. Since we care about hitting the highest speeds possible, let's test this using the highest thrust single nozzle engine in the game, the Clydesdale. To find the force and distance, I placed obstructions to the nozzle at different distances and measured the acceleration of the craft. For example, if the thrust on the obstruction is equal to the thrust of the nozzle, the acceleration will be zero. If the obstruction does not absorb any thrust at all, then the craft will accelerate at a rate given by Newton's second law. Also, I had cheats on for these tests to prevent the mass from changing and the obstruction from overheating in the engine exhaust. So here's the results. At distances below 9.8 meters from the nozzle, the obstruction blocked 100% of the thrust. At distances above this, the obstruction blocked 0% of the thrust. So it seems KSP applies a very simple uh, ray cast from the nozzle with a length of 9.8 meters. If this line intersects with a part, then it applies a constant force equal to the engine thrust. The fact that the force is constant is very good for us, as it simplifies a lot of the math. Alright, knowing this, now let's measure some projectile velocities and see how they compare to the conservation of energy equation. To test this, I took a large ore tank and varied the amount of ore in it and the number of Clydesdales firing at it. I also removed the atmosphere so that drag would not be a concern, and I used hack gravity to minimize gravity losses. To measure the ejection velocity, I just read the navball surface speed readout. The results from these tests were interesting. At low thrust, the prediction matches KSP pretty well. Here's the velocity versus projectile mass graph for a 10% thrust Clydesdale. The measured values, here in red, match the predicted velocity function, here in blue, pretty well. Here's at 50% thrust. Again, the measured values match the prediction pretty well. This also holds true for 100% thrust. However, as we increase the number of Clydesdales, the error increases dramatically. At 9 Clydesdales, you can see that the low mass projectile is significantly slower than predicted. At the high end, with 513 engines, some of the measured values were less than half of the predicted values. Also, what is this? When increasing the mass from 11 to 14 tons, the velocity actually increases from 613 meters per second to 1350 meters per second, which doesn't make any sense. I considered this could potentially be variance in the experiments, but these results are very consistent. Running this test with 900 ore, for example, consistently gave me velocities around 613 meters per second, within a few meters per second. Clearly something strange is going on here. While it seems inconsistent though, there may be a pattern here. Let's analyze the data some more. Let's plot velocity versus projectile acceleration so that we can compare the different thrusts all in one graph. We calculate acceleration from Newton's second law, F equals MA, where F is the force of the engine, M is the mass of the projectile, and A is the acceleration, of course. Here's the results from this. Interesting. There seems to be some linear steps in the data. The section on the right here and this section here seem fairly linear. Let's do some more experiments to fill this in more. I use different amounts of Clydesdales and smaller ore tanks to get different accelerations, 
and ran about 80 more experiments using the same procedure as before. And wow, here are the results. With more data points, you can clearly see there are several distinct linear regions of the graph. But why is this happening? Why aren't we getting a smooth curve for ejection velocity? Well, I think the answer is likely to do with the fact that KSP is a simulation and is limited by the size of its time step. Looking at the videos of the test clearly shows what's happening, actually. Let's take a closer look at two data points in particular, one on the right side of this discontinuity and one on the left side. In the first case, the projectile first receives a 500 meter per second boost in one frame and then travels beyond the engine force range in the second frame, and thus only gets one boost overall. In the second case, however, the projectile gets a 481 meters per second boost and travels a distance that's still within the force range of the booster, and as a result, gets a second boost from the engine that puts the velocity at 1347 meters per second. This explains why decreasing your acceleration can counterintuitively sometimes give you faster mass driver velocities. We can see now clearly that the linear portions of this graph correspond to the number of frames the boost from the engine is applied. This section here gets one boost, this section gets two boosts from the engine, this one three boosts, and so on. So if we want to be the most efficient with our mass driver, we want to hit these local maximums. Overall, it seems that sadly, mass drivers and KSP are much weaker than they should be. It seems you only get the predicted velocity at low speeds, and what fun is that? Well, actually, hold on. That isn't entirely true. Let's take a closer look at the right side of the graph again. Notice how the predicted value from the conservation of energy is a square root function, while the measured values are in a linear trend. As the acceleration increases, the linear function will grow faster than the square root one, which means that at some point KSP will actually deliver higher ejection velocities than predicted. So how do we get this high acceleration? Well, look at Newton's second law. From this equation, we can see that increasing the thrust and decreasing the mass will both result in a higher acceleration. We can decrease the mass pretty easily, actually. In the latest patch, the devs added these new flag parts. The smallest one has a minuscule mass of only 0.5 kilograms. What if we stick this part on a Clydesdale? The acceleration from this should be 6.6 .6 million meters per second, which according to this trend line should give us a velocity of about 26.4 kilometers per second. Let's give it a shot. And well, there you go. That is indeed 26.4 kilometers per second. The conservation of energy only predicts 11 kilometers per second here, so we are already doing much better. Let's push this further. The speed of light is about 300 million meters per second. If we want to hit this speed, we would need an acceleration of 75 billion meters per second squared, which corresponds to about 11,000 Clydesdale's engines. Eh, that's not really feasible. I have a good computer, but I doubt I can run that many. Let's just add as many boosters as we feasibly can and see how fast we can get. Here I got about a thousand boosters clipped together before the game started getting unbearably slow. After waiting for several minutes for it to load, we can hit the spacebar to fire up the engines and wait some more for the engines to load. After several more minutes of waiting for that, we have an engine ignition. Let's check on our projectile. According to the trend, this should have a speed of about 27 million meters per second. The actual speed is about 27 million meters per second, which is spot on the predicted value. Let's take a moment to appreciate just how fast this thing is going. This is 9% the speed of light. The flag left the Kerbin system in about three seconds and will pass ELU's orbit in less than an hour. So there you have it, 9% the speed of light with a stock mass driver. We could add even more engines to make this faster, but the game was already loading very slowly, so I think I'll stop here. You know, on second thought, I'm not really that satisfied with this. You still need cheats to do this since the flag instantly melts from overheating, and we also still need to remove the atmosphere. 
Maybe we can uh, get around this by placing the, the flag further away from the engine. Maybe that would help with the overheating. I tried different distances to see if I could get something to work. And this is when I made a big discovery. Apparently, and I can't explain why, dropping the flag into the exhaust plume instead of starting it inside the plume results in velocities five times higher than the other method. With this new knowledge, I did some more experiments to see how this velocity varied with force, and as with the other method, the result was linear, but with a much higher slope. Sadly, this technique didn't quite solve the overheating issue. However, it did make it more likely for the flag not to overheat or be affected by the atmosphere. To guarantee a successful run, we can just drop a bunch of flags into the booster just in case a few explode from overheating. According to this new trend line, we can actually reach the speed of light with about 2,500 boosters, all fully stock and no cheats needed to get around the atmosphere or overheating. I know I said 1,000 boosters was a lot last time, but this is too enticing to pass up. I'm gonna do this. After clipping this monstrosity together and waiting a long time for it to load, we are ready to fire. Just gotta light up the engines and... Okay, I guess we have to wait 30 more minutes for this, the engines to load too. Finally, 30 minutes later, the engines light up and the flags start falling down. Um, okay, this is still taking a long time. Uh, let me speed this up a bit. And there, pause the game. Let's check that velocity. 302 million meters per second. That's it, folks. We've exceeded the speed of light. The vast driver isn't quite done, though. As the rest of the flags fall into the engines, a series of flags leave Kerbin at the speed of light. If you thought 9% the speed of light was ridiculous, this is about 10 times more ridiculous. These flags left Kerbin's sphere of influence in less than one second, and will pass Elu's orbit in less than 10 minutes. The game didn't even have time to apply arrow or heat calculations since they were well beyond the atmosphere in just one frame. Sadly, we can't switch to any of these flags without cheats, or else they'll instantly explode due to overheating. You can see here that this flag was apparently at 145 million Kelvin, which is decently toasty. And with that, I'd say this project is finished. We've successfully reached light speed in stock KSP without cheats, mods, or any of the other usual exploits such as Kraken or Cal overclocking that would usually get us here. We've achieved this in perhaps the most Kerbal way possible. More boosters. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. There's still more to learn about mass drivers and KSP, so I encourage you to replicate these experiments yourself and develop new ones. I'll see you in the next one.